Rhinopolis, 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 we're not just gonna kid it. Rhinopolis, 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 we're not just gonna kid it. Yeah. Welcome to Rightopolis, featuring authors R.J. Barker, Scott K. Andrews, and Kid Power, and often a guest. Rightopolis is recorded live via Discord on alternating Sunday evenings. A conversational show with audience participation. Bark on without the BS. Funded entirely through the generosity of our Patreon backers. Patreon.com forward slash Rightopolis Podcast. Right on Bullis, right on Bullis, right on Bullis, we're not just gonna kid it. Right on Bullis, right on Bullis, right on Bullis, we're not just gonna kid it. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Oh, hello. Yeah, we... Hooray. Hooray. We, we don't even need kit. Um, I'll do the intro again, shall I? Go for it. <laughs> this has never happened, but I've never had to do the intro more than once. Ever. <laughs> um, I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Welcome to Rightopolis with me, RJ Parker, and Scott K. Andros. And this, this week, we have got the wonderful Sam Hawk. We don't have Kit because he's had a bit of a family emergency. It's not anything terrible, but he can't come here tonight because he's lazy, basically, I think. <laughs> um, and, um, and also, um, before I forget, this is going to be the last Rytopolis before we take a summer break for August because um, we all just had a massive row earlier on today. And Kit did his um, in rhyming doggerel through allegory and metaphor in quite a beautiful performance poetry piece. I just um, threw chips. Yeah, yeah. It was, so we, we're taking a break to just get away from each other. <laughs> um, but we'll be back in September, I think we agreed, didn't we, Scott? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, once once Scott once Kit had finished his poem, but I can't wait to hear him when he edits this because he hates poetry. But um, we've got the wonderful Sam Hawk, um, author of two fantastic novels. Do you want to tell us a bit about you and your books, Sam? Hello, thanks for having me. We, I'm we, sorry we, for we, you know <laughs> causing the end of right up was for some. Oh, uh, yeah, it's entirely awful, I'm afraid. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I assume that. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to be here, and um, uh, sorry about, you know, getting the day wrong. <laughs> no, uh, that was just enthusiasm. <laughs> For those that don't know, right. um, Sam was here 24 hours early, and she was ready, which we, we, we're we big fans of that, that manner of enthusiasm. Yeah, it's more um, professionalism so, uh, than any of us have ever shown. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, live in, I live in a horrible fear of screwing up time differences because um, I'm in Australia and my agent's in London and publisher is in New York. And so every single phone conversation we ever had had to balance three different time zones. Um, and I, I'm the kind of person who will just make myself anxious and, and sick expecting that I'm going to miss a meeting. So um I tend to, you know, the night before be, um, you know, waking up every hour afraid that I was going to not make it. Um, and I actually did do this for Rhinopolis, only I did it the night before the night before. Um, so I made myself sick on Friday night, um, waking up constantly thinking that I'd missed it. And then I had a nightmare that I'd missed the whole thing. And then I was all super prepared yesterday <laughs> and showed up and uh, there was no one here. And poor RJ had to gently tell me that I was doing for hours early. <laughs> I'm quite, anyway. I'm quite impressed, <laughs> and you, you mustn't feel feel ill about it because this is the most shambolic and amateurish podcast in existence, as far as we're aware. We take pride in it. We do. Oh, we yeah. take pride in it. Yeah, we've yeah. worked very yeah, hard. I'm not doing anxious this. about anything, guys. <laughs> it's, 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 a skill. it's a special skill. Yeah. Sorry, you did hey, ask me about books. books. You think it's yeah. easy yeah. to be this shambolic? We've put in, we've put in the hours. <laughs> yeah. We paid our dues. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you guys asked me five minutes ago to describe my books, and I still haven't yet. So I think I'm I'm on board with the shambles. Yeah, and that's that, good. That, that is exactly the level of professionalism that we aim for yeah. here. That, that's yeah. the sort of guest we're after. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. Okay, so um, Poison Wars. I wrote a duology called The Poison Wars. The first book mm-hmm. is City of Lies, and the second is Hollow Empire. They are kind of weird. Um, ostensibly epic fantasies, um, or at least they're wearing the clothes of epic fantasies. The first one is really more like a closed room murder mystery. And the second one is um, sort of a political thriller, I guess. Um, But um, 
The first one is a, a story about a brother and sister who are poison testers for the ruling family of a country. Uh, his main job is to, you know, test their food uh, and protect them from internal and external threats. Um, at the beginning of the story, their their uncle, who is the current poison tester who trained them, and the chancellor are both poisoned by a previously unknown poison. Uh, and during the funeral, the, the city, the entire city, is besieged by an unknown army. So basically, my characters are stuck in a besieged city, trying to work out uh, who poisoned their uncle and the chancellor before um, the new chancellor is poisoned, um, or the city falls to the army. So yeah, it's basically just like a big closed room mystery, um, stuck in a in city. And that's a really one cle is... clever way of doing a locked room mystery as well with the it besieging is. army. Yes. Really and I'm good. thinking. A, a kind of like fantasy type story that's secretly a murder mystery. I can't think of anyone who's who's done so, anything similar. RJ, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's weird because our books came out at a very similar time, and there are a lot of sort of superficial resemblances. We do have for... some similarities. I think. Yeah. I think. Well, I think people who like my books tend to like your books also. Yeah, yeah I think there's a lot of crossover. Uh, I've, I, I, yeah. you've mentioned we also it have, to your you readers know, and I've main characters. And... Yeah, um, yeah, because we were the zeitgeist. Yeah. I think. That's totally. the truth. Yeah, we were we were there on the, on the book. Yeah. <laughs> and and the second, they will look back on us, aren't they? They they will, trailblazers. And they will be going, Oh, we should have read them at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All of you bastards, you should have read them yeah. at the time. That's true. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, and the second one. Last year. Yeah, the second one came out mm -hmm. last year, um and in, in that one, um uh our stalwart heroes are um sorting out a um who is kind of behind a, a series of increasing attacks during effectively the fantasy olympics so they have a bunch of um dignitaries from other countries and the city is full of visitors um from other places uh during yeah what what is a, a giant celebration that's that's kind of kind of the olympics um sport and art and, and fun um so uh yeah this one is a kind of a more of a Team clock trying to work out who um, who's got something horrible planned for their um, for their Olympic celebration, um, but yeah, more of the same intrigue and um, um, mysteries and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, they're quite fun if you um, if you like a bit of suspense and mystery in your fantasy. Um, probably low on the lower at least on the kind of magic and yeah. big big magical creature kind of kind of fantasy. Because you're also one of those people who writes books, which can be quite stressful, depending on what type of person you are, and also has an amazingly stressful real job that, that you uh, do as well. Um, I, I'm a lawyer in my day job. Um, yeah. But I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not How do you do both who, things? Well, very poorly, my answer is generally. I just do a lot of things very badly. Um. Uh, yeah, I'm not the kind of lawyer who you know goes to court and and it ever has anyone you know, perceiving me directly. I just uh, sit in my office and and write difficult legal advice all day. Basically, it can be quite stressful though. It's it's very time consuming and um you know if you guys are planning your careers um a second career around writing as well, then I don't actually recommend one that involves sitting staring at a computer typing for many many. <laughs> oh, I, I can day. I can second that as someone who um currently is is part of the team managing the nhs test and trace website um, oh boy yeah, yeah it's 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 a bit of a busman's holiday <clears throat> uh, yeah so that's why i don't do any real work yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can, you know australian lawyers do you get wigs uh yes i mean i don't because i don't go to court but, but do you, I have worn do you a have wig. One? i wore a wig once when i got admitted to court i borrowed a wig we have a shared wig at work <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very hygienic. Uh, you spray it with disinfectant a lot. Because that's that's on my list of things that I want. Um, I want a really good sort of old-fashioned top hat with the type that bows out, and I want a yeah. lawyer's wig because I love them. At the same time, I'd wear them both. Oh yeah, if I could yeah, together, yeah. obviously. But you, it's not physical because people have much smaller heads back when they wore top hats, and, and it's yeah. very difficult to get a top hat that fits a. 20th century person. I feel Unless very sympathetic got... to this. I have a, I come from a very large head family. 
<laughs> but this is not where the people were expecting it would go. The size of your head. <laughs> is that is that a true fact? Have, have, has head sharp head size grown over the last like hundred years? Really? Yeah. Really? Try, yeah. Try or and we get... all just got like bigger hair. No, we no, we've all got bigger heads. Try try and get an original sort of eighteen hundreds top hat. We are bigger in general. It's the same for military uniforms. I've got French. Um, uh, oh, I can't remember his name. People loaded cannons, um, military jacket, and it barely fits me. And I'm not big. Uh, and he would have yeah, been. Yeah, we're just getting taller, aren't we? Yeah, taller and, and everything. Yeah. We, I think it would look got, very weird if we got taller. Our heads didn't get bigger. But yeah. they just like really tall people with pin heads. <laughs> Eventually, we will all look at the knee comp. <laughs> uh, and yes, um, Alicia, it is it is very hot where you're weak, uh, and in a country like ours, it is ridiculous to do so. Although yeah. having said that, I'm car- I'm currently wearing an hoodie. Do you guys have hoodies? Hoodies? Or that? Yeah. I don't know. If, no, no hoodie with no age. No. I don't. No. Uh, no right. I don't. Actually, there might be an Australian invention, but it is basically this thing that I'm wearing. It's essentially a cross between a hoodie and the softest blanket you've ever felt. So I'm, I've become an, a giant teddy bear wrapped in this, this oversized thing that is basically a wearable blanket. Uh, and people are going nuts with them over here. Everyone's got hoodies um, because it's freezing over here at the moment. You guys are probably warm and I'm freezing. And I'd, I'd happily wear a wig right now. You see, that doesn't, that doesn't work with our, our image of Australia that it's freezing. <laughs> hoodies and, hoodies I, and wigs at 5am yeah, in the winter. Yeah. yeah, I know it's massive. It, it, yeah. on a kind it was of... snowing yesterday, RJ. In Australia, can you imagine that? Yeah, Scott? Does, does that I had just to make take your my head poor little dog out for a walk. He hated it. It's so cold. Yeah, I, uh, I've got relatives in New Zealand, and I remember um, getting a letter from them when I was little saying that there had been snow, and they they just stopped school immediately, and everybody just run outside <laughs> in wonder, and it snowed for twenty yeah. whole minutes, and uh, oh, yeah. it was like it's, a massive event. It's very exciting. It's very yeah. exciting when it snows. It's snow is um, always exciting though. Yeah, I love snow. It, yeah. it only snows in where I am. It's actually too cold for snow, um, as in it's it's the, the wrong temperature for snow to settle and form and settle. Um, so we only get snow very occasionally in Canberra. Um, probably the only one of my strongest and warmest childhood memories is the time that it snowed properly, which was in I think nineteen eighty six or nineteen eighty seven, and it snowed properly, so we could you know actually build snowmen and have snow fights and stuff. And I just have such strong memories of that day because it was so unusual. It snows every, every couple of years. We'll get some snow, and it snows in the mountains surrounding Canberra, but it doesn't settle in the city very often. And when it You're does, ru- it's, it's extremely exciting. You're ruining my image of Australia. So please say that you are surrounded by animals that will kill you at the drop of a hat. That's always, true. Isn't it? Always. Oh, oh, good. Um, that's all right. Or the, the I, um, <laughs> or the top of the wig. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd be terrified that there'd be some kind of poisonous spider lurking in the wig. Yeah, well, I mean, it's Australia, so you don't put yeah. anything on without checking for spiders first. <laughs> Fair enough. That's standard practice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, you only do that. Shoes and gloves. Shoes and gloves, you always check. My it's wife has said, practice, if I'm ever asked to go and do like a, a, a thing in Australia, she's just not coming. There's just no chance on earth she's setting up because <laughs> there are spiders there that can bite you back, and that's just enough for her. She's just like, no, it's not happening. You she prefers go on to bite own. her own spiders? She murders them if they come in the house. She hates them with a proper arachnophobe, so she won't yeah. go to Australia. Well, I, I always think that, that it's just important that you hook up with a person who has the opposite spider tendency to you. So in every couple, there should be at least one person who can handle spiders, and as long as you've got that, you're fine. So well, tra- up, my mum was the one who could handle spiders. My dad would leave the room immediately. We've trained our son there. to do it. Oh, oh, well, that's even better. Yeah, he's not frightened of spiders at all. Not, my children aren't either. In fact, they, they name the spider in our bathroom um, Spooky, uh, and they get very upset if there's any suggestion that Spooky could be harmed. Um, <laughs> so, the, yeah, they have a very, very um, strong... Well, they, they both love animals, which is, is is fine and lovely. And we're all vegetarians now because my younger son, um, sort of once he got grappled with the idea of what meat was, was not into it. Um, so we're now all vegetarians. We've been for the last couple of years, um, and it's lovely and it's great that he cares about animals so much. But it does mean that like there's a silverfish on the ground, um, you know, heading towards a pile of paper, and he won't squish it because we're not allowed to squish animals. Um, and you know, I love animals as well, but I, I, mm. I don't have a hell of a lot of respect for silverfish. 
No. no, no. <laughs> that, when I was at university, I went out with a girl who had a pet tarantula. And in the uh, it was the big girls only block. And whenever there was a spider anywhere, all the other girls would scream and come running to her door and knock on her door. And she would have to. She was like the designated spider wrangler for the entire door. Yeah. She was so cool. Yeah, yeah. When it's when the, important. when the boy was was very little, they had like an animal day at school, and the only thing he was interested in was a tarantula. He wanted to hold the tarantula. <laughs> <laughs> and he ignored everything else. He went straight to the tarantula and he held it in his hands and he was really joyful and really happy about it. And then his mum couldn't touch him for two days. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, we had to walk home behind her and everything. Because she, oh, she just, when she looked at him, she just saw this child with a spider in her head. Just like, no, I can't, I can't. I don't love him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to, um, you know, correct people about the whole Australia having too many dangerous animals thing. Um, mm. And in some in, in some respects, you know, unlike North America, we don't have you know, bears and mm. horrible, terrifying mountain lions or anything running around. So we're in a better state than that. Um, but I did I did spend several years of my childhood obsessed with this Reader's Digest big hardback book called Australia's Dangerous Creatures. I loved that book from ages sort of seven to nine. I just used to read it cover to cover. Um, it, it's very unclear why, but then, you know, <laughs> the few photographs there are of me at that age, I seem to always have that book in my lap, um, which means that I have a terrifying encyclopedic knowledge of everything that can kill you here. Um, and I have like an anecdote about someone who died horribly from basically everything, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is not as good a skill as you think it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's got quite dark already. That's good stuff. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always, I'm always ca- quite upset that kangaroos can kill you. It's not yeah. how I want to think of them, but yet yeah, they're, they're big sort of murder hoppers. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, they, they usually won't try, but um, if you've ever been sort of surrounded by ruse, um, uh, it can be quite intimidating. <laughs> you know, you're sort of feeding them, and then they get the gist that you've got a bucket of feed. Um, and they, you know, start mm. the claws start getting a little close, and then they start trying to remove the feed from you. Um, it can be slightly intimidating. They're a lot bigger than you think they are. Yeah, and I've never seen a big red one up close, um, but they're massive. They've got quite haughty faces as well. I think. Yeah, kangaroos. I think that's fair. Yeah. They're doing this exhibit at our. Um, yeah. <laughs> they're, doing, yeah. they're doing this exhibit at our botanic gardens at the moment, where they have got. Um, um, they've got sort of models of Australia's prehistoric um, large mammals. Um, so we, we, you know, our giant, I'm trying to think of the word, what are they called? Um, they're the giant mammals that we all sort of murdered and so we don't have them anymore. Um, really? You know, like oh, no, they were birds. <sighs> no, anyway, anyway, there's a whole, there's a, there's a word for the, the category of animals that we, that we, don't have any more of the kind of giant prehistoric things. Yeah, well, they are extinct. But they're, they're, they're. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> they have them there at the zoo. One of them is a giant kangaroo. Um, uh, sort of, we had giant, you know, giant, we had used to have giant wombats and giant kangaroos. Mm. But the giant kangaroo has a sort of a standard kangaroo body, except for that they were like two meters tall. Um, and its face is like a pug. <laughs> it's sort of a squashed <laughs> little dog face. Megafauna, yes. Thank you, Katie. That's what that's um... It's such a good word as well, megafauna. I love it. Yeah, it's a great word. Um, I've, I've still been trying to work into my books megafauna somehow. Um, no one, there, there are some, there are some tunnels in, um, in the story, in the story, <laughs> in the first book, which I secretly always hope someone will ask me, "How did those tunnels get there?" I can say, "Well, once upon a <laughs> time, they had giant megafauna, megafauna that <laughs> dug out." Anyway, no one ever asked. <laughs> Um, but you should see what a kangaroo, if, if you think a, a current kangaroo has a haughty face, you should see what it happens when it's a pug face because it is extremely haughty but also comically ugly. I was, I, I, fiddles is, is bad. I bet if I Google this, I'm going to discover giant kangaroos were delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we don't have megafauna, right, because um, they didn't humans and the animals have to evolve at the same rate so they get used to our presence and don't we don't ruin them all. So you know um, that's why Africa still has giant animals like elephant, elephants and mm. giraffes and so on because humans evolved it like in concert with them. Whereas here, all our megafauna were here, and then humans turned up and killed killed them all basically. We're a bit bit like about to fit that. We we usually have a bit where we talk about what media we've been consuming. 
oh, yeah. over the past couple of weeks. Um, I, I've been looking forward to this because I'm actually quite angry about one of the things I watched. I'm, I'm, you know, when you watch something and you're just angry with yourself for watching it. Yep. I, I, I've well, done that. But okay, you, have to, you have to go first now. Yeah, well, I'm going to come to like yeah. whatever you're going to agree with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm reading still um, An Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, which is about how fungus how is in everything, and it's really fascinating. Uh, and a book called The Lost Army of Cambacy by Paul Sussman, which is kind of a, a murder mystery set now, but it links back to an Egyptian army in the times of the pharaoh that was lost in the desert. Uh, and I'm not sure if I like it. Um, I watched the end of Loki, and I was like, uh, that, were, "That was all right." Have you been watching it? I did. I did watch Loki, and I I enjoyed it. Although I felt like it could have been anyone, but it didn't have to be Loki. It didn't feel like an actual show about a trickster. So it kind of wasn't the the. I felt like they could have used Tom Hiddleston could have been playing literally anyone in that story, yeah. which wasn't yeah. really about Loki. And that was yeah, kind of sort of what I was missing from it. I enjoyed it, but it just wasn't mm. really a story. I, I thought that they took the most interesting character in the Marvel universe and and managed to make him give him his own show, build the show around him, and then make him the most boring character on his own show. <laughs> it was really strange. <laughs> <laughs> they did exactly the same with Black Widow as well. Yes, yeah. yes, um, yeah. She was kind of every, everybody else in that movie was was more exciting than her. Yeah, um, yeah. but I. Um, yeah, I think that's probably – well, she was involved in the making of that, right? So it was probably actually – She was a producer, I think, yeah. Yeah. So she kind of gave spotlight to everybody else in the film, I have to assume, on purpose. Yeah, I thought that was quite generous of her if, if she yeah. did that. I've also been watching um, was... The Mysterious Benedict Society on Disney+, Plus, which is just lovely. It's very Lemony Snicket. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And, and I hadn't they're seen that. Yeah, they're releasing it episode by episode, and it doesn't seem to have been picked up by. But it's just lovely. It's about some very clever children who are sent to spy on someone, but it's really mannered and quirky. Is and it based on the, a book? I feel like I've got that book on my shelf. Yes, I think it is based on a book, but we've not read the book, so it's all new to us. But it, it, its lineage, lineage is clearly Lemony Snicket. You can you can see that, and the way it's shot, they've clearly watched Lemony Snicket as well and thought, "Well, this works." That kind of very arch way of doing it. Um, but it's just delightful. And the kids, the four main kids, are brilliant, uh, and the the actors backing them up are superb. And one of the actors, um, have you watched Bosch? Mm-hmm. I haven't. Um, this will mean nothing to you then, Sam, but it, everyone else will be very, <laughs> be very disappointed if I don't mention Bosch. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I was about to say how it's 26 minutes, everybody. 26 minutes for this week's uh, this, this <laughs> Bosch, Bosch, Bosch countdown. Okay. It was 26 yeah. minutes. Um, okay. in, in, I'm quietly in, Googling in, Bosch while you talk. Oh, it's, it's brilliant, Sam, but I'll, I won't run about it to you just now because um, they're sick of me talking. But in one of them, there's a, there's a no, lawyer called Hardy. No, no, a detective. <laughs> detectives. Um, there's a lawyer called Honey Chandler, and she has a private investigator. And he's in it. He's not in it a lot, but he is in it enough to recognise. And he's in the B- mysterious Benedict Society. And you know, when you see someone, they're not what you expect them to be. You just can't place them. But you're going to know the person. And it drove me quite mad for the first two episodes. Um, Do you repeatedly say that out loud until Mrs. RJ wants to slap you in the face? Well, we're both doing it. Yeah, you, oh, you should, uh, we that's, that's a good match. Yeah, I, I know that. I not like it when I constantly say how I um, can't play some, an actor, but I can't shut up about it until I know who they are. I have to Google it now. Straight yeah. away. Well, I guess Google has saved us from this. I just become, he has very, very recognisable hair. It's, it's really weird. As soon as you see him, <laughs> as soon as you see him, you'll know exactly what I mean. Think, oh yeah, he's got really, he's got quite long hair, but it's quite recognisable. Um, a new thing started in the UK this week called Professor T with um, oh that man that was a comedian whose name I forgot. Miller. Ben Miller that was quite fun. It's a remake of a um, Belgian Danish? program. Belgian, Danish, Belgian, that's right. yeah, Belgian. Yeah. And we also watched Baptiste, um, which has just restarted. Um, we watched season one because we'd not seen it in caught up. Season one is very weird because it's six episodes. Really good and literally like they were starting to shoot episode six. It's like somebody turned up and said, oh, this, you know, this is your last one. 
and they, they just tell you what happened. <laughs> It's, it's it's the strangest thing I've ever seen. It's just they just like oh this is what actually happened. I'm like okay, yep. and then we started watching season two, which is just I don't like it. Too grim for me. It's a spin off of The Missing, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, I don't know. Season yeah, he's a character yeah. in The Missing, and he then he got his own show. Oh, because he's quite watchable. He's, he's very very watchable, but it's really weird the way they, and the season two they've done with a lot of flashbacks. And I actually think it, it it betrays it doesn't help the format. It just it's there to be clever rather than helping the story. And and then the thing that I'm I'm going to be really angry about is um I watched the Tomorrow War, which um is on Disney. Is that I don't the one know if you Chris Pratt in it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen it, but I've seen a lot of people on Twitter complaining about its plot holes. Uh, oh. Uh, why, are you, why are you angry, RJ? Come on, tell me. Tell me. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil it for you, Sam, but it doesn't deserve not to be spoiled. It's so bad. Yeah, uh, no, that's, that's fair. <laughs> the, the plot is that in like 20 years or so, aliens come to Earth and, and they're wiping everybody out. So they, some humans come back in time and say, we need soldiers in the future. And anyone that dies before these aliens come, they send into the future to fight. And I'm Chris Pratt goes into the future to be one of these soldiers yeah. and then he yeah. discovers that his daughter is leading the resistance against these aliens and the whole emotional plot point of like the first I thought it was the end but it wasn't the end sadly um, it, is, that, <laughs> is that oh after seven days you're automatically sent back if you're still alive um, it, the whole emotional plot point is that he doesn't want to leave his lo- daughter and there's this whole thing where he's like oh my god I'll never see you again but he literally will see you again <laughs> I mean if he doesn't go back he won't <laughs> no, no he, he's going back she's there and, and then they, they invent this poison to kill the aliens um, and the plan is that he'll go back in time to make the poison for people to bring back to the future to kill the aliens with but they get overrun by the aliens so he goes back in time with the poison and everyone's like, oh, we failed. And we, I was just sat there going, no, no, you haven't failed. No, that wasn't, back- the, the, plan wasn't, the plan wasn't to mass what? produce the poison in the past and then send it to the future. The, po- the plan was always to go back to the past, mass produce the poison so they're ready when the aliens come. His daughter uh, was always intending to sacrifice herself and make herself a redundant timeline. That was always the plan. But, the, but when he gets back, nobody knows about that. That's true. He gets back and says, oh, I've got this poison, and the aliens are coming, and everyone goes, well, yeah, we're whatever. not spending taxpayer money on them. Literally, the whole world has come together to fight these aliens, and they all go, well, no. No, because that's 20 not That's not going to be re-elected. To I'm be not going to put money yeah. into that. If someone, if someone showed up now and <laughs> yeah. said, I'm from the future, I've got this poison for the aliens right now, people wouldn't spend money on it, would they? <laughs> but, oh, oh I've, got it. I've never seen a film that has just... So, and then later on, there's like the big bad alien, which is the worst one of all of them, and he punches it. He punches the alien. He does. It's, it's he like does. if if you reshot the end of Aliens, but Ripley didn't have the thing, and she just punched the queen. <laughs> it, it, it's just, oh, it's so bad. I think you should watch it, though, Sam. You're and make looking forward to the sequel, then, well, I have to no. now. Yeah, there's not going to be a sequel, is there? Of course there is. It's, no. been a huge, it's been a huge hit for Amazon. And this, the, the, the premise of the sequel is built into the film. No, but what is it that, is it that she... What is the premise of the sequel, Scott? Tell me. Just it, so the, the, okay, we are just spoiling this movie for everybody here. But the, at the end of the movie, they discover that the aliens... Are, are not invaders. They were they were like cargo on a cattle mm. ship that accidentally crashed on the planet, and the cattle got out. And the people who built the ships and fly them around, they 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 died in the crash. So the question at the end of the movie is: Are these aliens like just cattle? Were they just flying them somewhere, and they were gonna like you know treat them like cows, or are these aliens uh, creatures that have been specifically designed to drop on planets and clear the planet out before the people that created them turn up and then take over the planet because everyone else has been killed by the aliens that they've dropped. And so Ooh. you've got the aliens that made the aliens are clearly going to turn up in the second film. Ah, uh, well, maybe it'll be better in some way. Maybe they'll kill Chris Pratt at the beginning. I- I'm down with that. I'm yeah. definitely down with that. 
Because you cannot get over the fact that he's Star Lord at any point in that film. Because mm. he, he's playing it serious, but I just could not get past the fact that he's Star Lord. That that's all I can see him as. Which was just sad. I used to like him so much in Parks and Rec days, and now he's ruined. <laughs> he's he's ruined it. And what, he's, ruined. What he's ruined everything. But I've had my rant now about how terrible the Tomorrow Water is, and, and just annoyed me. It in and you seem really good at popcorn. I don't know why it vexed me so much. I can just sort of shut out ridiculous. It was just so blatant in, in ignoring the viewer and just. Oh, I need to stop, Scott. What have you been watching? <laughs> um, oh, well, 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 I'm, I'm, go on, oh, Sam. You you go first. You go yeah. first. And I was just going to say, I, I watched the entirety of the new He-Man yesterday after I accidentally got up at 5am to not be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and so did the... Um, uh, okay, so let's not spoil it for everybody else by revealing what happens at the end of episode one, which has sent certain parts of the internet into mm. a massive meltdown. How did you feel about it? I actually yeah, really enjoyed it. it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, really, I really enjoyed it. I felt like it was... Um, if you're going to do a, a, a cartoon that is that treats the the eighties um He Man as as canon. So you're not redoing it like they did with Shira, but you're you're actually trying to continue the story. I think they did it in a way that that made the story interesting and um in which they sort of treat the source material very lovingly. So it's um it's clearly made by people who loved who loved He Man. Um and as an eighties child that was you know that was I, I just have such a special place in my heart for He Man, even though it is objectively terrible. Um, I've seen happening. some some quite right wing people very angry that, that liberals have ruined their twenty five minute toy advert. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I guess because yeah, effectively Teela is the main character, um, and a you know she has a girl like a, and she has like you know a, a buds kind of one side and undercut and and big arms and stuff. So yeah, I imagine I imagine right wingers don't enjoy it. Um, but but I, I don't think it's disrespectful at all to the um, – if you can be disrespectful to, as you say, a, a toy advert. Um, it's, it, it, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure actually what that's possible. But I just don't think it really sort of spoils anything from the, the childhood. It, it, it really treats it, treats it um, very gently and, and kindly. And ev- everyone, sort of the characters, have, have actual kind of personalities and – um, Skeletor is, is actually quite frightening in this in this version of it, as opposed to hilariously camp, which is what he really was in the eighties. Um, yeah, I, just, gonna... I was a really important part of in, for me for He Man because it was uh, not just for the show, but we they were the only they were the only toys sort of brand name toys we ever owned. So I was one of five kids and we did not have much money, yeah. um, but we did accumulate some Masters of the Universe. Um, I think because pit friends or relatives sometimes gave them to my my older brother um, and my older sister. So we had a reasonable collection of them. And um, long after He-Man stopped airing on TV, we had an ongoing game called Find the Masters of the Universe, which (laughs) we would separate all of the goodies and the baddies into two piles. And my older sister and my older brother and I, um, two of us would be the finder and one person would be the hide as you hide all of the... um, the Masters of the Universe around the house, and we had lab, sort of elaborate rules about you, you had to always have some part of the toy visible, so you couldn't mm. hide them like in the drawer unless their arm was sort of reaching out of the drawer or whatever. Um, and we, we had a and so one person you'd, you'd hide them all, and one person would find all the goodies, and one person would find all the baddies. Uh, and we had rules about <laughs> increasing difficulty of of which which toys um, were hidden where. So you know, Clawful would always sort of he was sort of a joke one. He you always had to hang him from his claw somewhere. So he was never hard to find. He was more like a comedy find. Whereas Skeletor was always the hardest baddie to find. And Teela was always the hardest goodie to find. Um, and once memorably, I, I hid Teela in the sand at the bottom of an empty fish tank with just her hand coming out of the sand. <laughs> and no one found her for a very long time. And I had forgotten where she was. We didn't find her for a while. Anyway, that was my aside about why I loved us of the universe. And at five AM, when you meant to, meant to be asleep, um, it, it was it was uh, it was good cheer. I liked it. I was always quite cross that they called Adam's cat Cringer. I, I never thought he stood a chance. 
No, no. Because <laughs> I think it's nominative determinism. I, I, I think poor, poor thing. Right. Maybe who's I think they, told do address, us. they do address that in the show, RJ. Do they? Oh, I might watch it. I'm going to watch it with my, my mm. little boy, who um, we've been yeah. at A&E with because he thought he'd broken his toe. But he oh, hadn't broken really? his No, he hasn't broken his toe. He, okay. So we, oh, just, we, just, toe. we just had a day out at the hospital. Which was oh, oh fun different. times! I've had a few of those recently. <laughs> yeah, I have broken lots of toes, and it's not very nice, and they take ages to heal, and there's no real way of making it better. They're just annoying. Yeah. No, no, Mrs. The worst thing dislocate. Yeah, my other half has broken her toe, and she's always hoping she'll break it again, and maybe it'll go right, and it won't hurt as much. And then she did break it again. Now it's worse. So be careful what yeah, you wish for. Multiple multiple breaks don't help. I've got one toe no. that I shattered, in, in particularly bad fashion and yeah it works as a bit of a weather vane now you know it aches when it rains and so on and it's a horrible <laughs> crunching crunching noise I've when i've never it. broken a bone anyway never. not any no. bones not any you're, bones you're really missing out scott it's great <laughs> oh yeah it's a great experience <laughs> toes. you can't do martial arts and never break toes it's just uh mm. you, especially the ones i do because you um you just get your toes caught in the mats, basically, and oh. pivoting. So you, you break them and dislocate them a lot. Oh, God. I the guy, who, my, the um, guy who lives over the road from me, he he is he was a professional dancer. So he's, like, professionally oh, yeah. graceful and, like, in control of his body. And I, I saw him a couple of weeks ago, and he came out with a, a cast on his foot, and I said, I don't know what happened. He said, I broke my foot. I said, how did that oh, happen? Man. And he, he got he got really bashful, and he was like, well, yeah. So no, go on, go on. How did it happen? He goes, you sure you want me to tell you? Said, yeah, go on. How, how did you break your foot? I, I broke it putting my pants on. <laughs> <laughs> and he got his he got his foot caught in the leg of his of his boxers, and he'd gone over like a sack of spuds and broken his foot. No. And I'm standing there trying not to laugh in his face. <laughs> oh, oh, poor guy! Isn't it, isn't it surprisingly common though that? I it's think those, it is. It's one of those weird things. Surprising. Come on. I, I've only ever, I broke my elbow playing ten pin bowling, and it was the first thing I did. I fell over um, on the you know where they shine it all up on the thing. I stepped on it and just fell backwards straight onto my elbow and I broke it. But I didn't know I'd broken it, so I just carried on. I thought I just oh. bruised it, and it's the only game of ten pin bowling I've ever won in my entire life. <laughs> You've never wanted to repeat that. <laughs> no. So, so, which is just really weird. And then we were sort of leaving afterwards, and my other half was going, you've got a very strange colour. I said, like, yeah, I think I might have hurt myself more than I thought. And we went to hospital. I went, yeah, you broke your elbow. You didn't make it any better by playing temp and bowling afterwards. You shouldn't have done that. Oh, so, my God. I know that now. But... Didn't at the time. So you, were, you were actually trying to bowl them badly, but your broken elbow was putting the spin on the ball. That, I, I, that I don't know. Clearly, one, maybe, it was, maybe it was adrenaline. <laughs> I was just like, uh, an adrenaline rush of pain or whatever. Oh, look, Katie was on the Yorkshire County Tempin bowling team for multiple years as a child. Ooh. Did you have to break your elbow every time you played? Every time? That, that does sound difficult. <laughs> you need more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so do, does he man get your thumbs up then? So uh, it does, it does. But I will yeah. say that my um that was accidental media consumption. Um my, my most deliberate media consumption in the last little bit is um my my now true love, Ted Lasso. Um I love that show so much. I just I cannot I cannot say too much how much I I love that show. I've heard uh, have you guys watched it? I've heard Not a yet. lot about it, but it's on it's on Apple, isn't it? And it is, yeah. it is on Apple. I'm waiting. Um, for... However, it's worth doing a free trial just just to watch it. Mm. Well, I'm waiting for my free free trial until Slow Horses comes on Apple, um, which is oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's Gary Oldman and Dave Casters. It's a weird bit of casting. I don't know if you've had have you had Slow Horses over in Australia, Mick Herons? No, 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 I didn't. Just... So. I mean, we might have, but I haven't heard it. They're amazing sort of spy thrillers, which are not my thing usually, but they're Ooh. just stunning. And um, the main character in it is referred to looking like Timothy Spall, if Timothy, Timothy Spall let himself go. Um, and, <laughs> and, and weirdly, rather than casting Timothy Spall, they've cast Gary Oldman as him. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, Gary Oldman's a very good actor. He is, but he's a bit. Oh, that's good. that's because Timothy Spall sorted himself out. He's thin as a rake now. Oh no, Tim! Yeah, what he he is. Oh, what a letdown! Got it. That's not the. That's ruined Jackson Lamb for me now. <laughs> but yeah, but anyway, I'm that's what I'm waiting for. Timothy Spall now. Yeah. Oh, well, when you when you do get Apple, I I recommend it yeah. also very highly. Um, oh. It's probably a bit a bit straight and white, but otherwise it is um, mm. it's very lovely. Um, and it's just sort of like a one of those shows that make you feel better for having watched it. Um, <laughs> and I, have, I mean, I have a bit of a weakness for um, for Bill Lawrence shows, um, mm. and I just don't really think there's anybody else who nails quite that um, that mix of really funny really funny work that um mm. also sometimes just punches you in the chest repeatedly what else um, he done? is it kind oh, of he's, like... scr- he's in scrubs in. scrubs and oh. um um oh god what was, what was, what was michael j fox spin city um those sort of shows i loved i loved scrubs i thought scrubs was the, the sort of premier example of shows that went from humor to tears very quickly and smoothly um yeah but no it's just it's just very lovely you love every single one of the characters i just want the best for them um, I like, <laughs> yeah, I like brooklyn, nine, brooklyn 99 for that as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's that it's that sort of thing where where you just it, it probably starts with a hmm. people in more antagonistic positions but you kind of get to know them as the series goes on and just deeply love all of them but, yeah, you um, had... it's, it's lovely. It's very funny. It's very well written, and it doesn't do any of the things you expect it's going to do, like the sort of normal writing traps that you expect mm-hmm. a series that's set around a particular central conflict is going to go, mm-hmm. and it just doesn't. Um, it just bypasses those things, and it just has lovely friendships, and it's, oh, it's, it's gorgeous. Uh, you really like it, RJ, I'm sure. Have you had Harrow? Because I think it's a, an Australian thing. We've been watching Harrow. Me and Mrs. RJ. Oh. It's um know, right? Hornblower, you and Griffiths as a um an Australian uh, coroner who solves crimes. Oh. And it's quite wonderful because he plays it as you and Griffiths, who's like a Shakespearean actor. And, and he's really <laughs> watchable while being entirely wrong. I don't think it's just <laughs> it's really odd. We we've compulsively watched it. And, and, but it's quite fun. But I don't know what it I'll is. Look it up. Shot in Brisbane. There you go. Yeah, it's it's, and he lives on a, on a boat, and it's absolutely preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> but he stage acts it, and, and and everyone else is kind of quite TV actor, and you can tell when somebody's stage acting on TV, and it's quite. quite <laughs> What, what so about is it you? genuinely good, or is it just? <laughs> it uh, it's quite a good murder mystery thing if you like murder mysteries, which we do. I do like. I do like yeah, uh, and it does do a bit of like it, I hate it when murder mysteries start to sort of turn slowly into soap opera. Every um, show yeah. trends towards soap over time, yeah. no matter what yeah, kind of show time, it is. That's true. Sci-fi, horror, mm. comedy, murder mystery. Every show trends towards soap. Yeah, which is why I've just given up on Lucifer. The, I really enjoyed Lucifer when it started and, and it's just kind of become a soap opera and, and quite tedious to me. Sorry if you love Lucifer. Oh, no, I, I do love Lucifer. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> that was very emphatic, Scott. <laughs> very emphatic. Oh, do you mean the TV you show? Few, yes, then. yes. yes. I, I, I love the TV show, not, not the Lord of Flies master. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, Katie said it did the thing. It put the two will they want the leads together, and that's like the kiss of death. You can't. On do which it. note, can somebody explain to me why the fuck we have not yet got an HD remastered copy of Moonlighting on any streaming service? Uh, sorry, uh, it maybe it's maybe it dates. Uh, I was going to say, well, I was going to say maybe it dates very badly, but that, that doesn't work on Scott. Because you no. don't care, do you? No, just... I don't care. I don't Legend. care. <laughs> I'm watching Doctor Who from 1963. Yes. I finished. I just finished a, an epic rewatch of Bergerac, which is terrible. Yes. <laughs> okay. Who had 48 minutes in the Bergerac pool? Uh, go, you, you must. Right. Sorry. Yes. What have I been watching? Um, I got really depressed. 
um, for various reasons. And I decided I needed to cheer myself up. So I started watching lots of comedy um, to try and cheer myself up. And I binge watched all of Friends season one in about a week. And um, it's brilliant. It's just brilliant. It's really well written. It's really well acted. It's just funny. It's just just funny. Um, Besides everything else, although immediately you crest over to season two, it goes into soap immediately oh. it, it trends towards soap too strongly but the first season is a, is a perfect lovely thing but even better than that i watched a series it's on uh i play here i think it's on hbm max in america called starstruck which is a six-part sitcom written by and starring rose matafeo who's a kiwi comedian. oh she's great yeah and it it's just delightful it's so funny and good-natured and sweet and the basic premise it's it's essentially the almost the same premise as notting hill um she goes out to a nightclub she gets drunk she has a one night stand with a guy and when she wakes up next to him in the morning she suddenly realizes he's a major motion picture star um and it, the whole thing it's just joy so i strongly recommend starstruck um oh, it's on iview excellent yeah, I'm it's, gonna, it's, I'm gonna write that down it's, it's a great show to watch in just one go. It's just mm. a pleasure. And then I watched I watched Chef, the Jean Favreau movie, in in which he plays as a chef who just goes mm. and sets up a food truck and it's really life affirming and funny and delightful. Um I watched Palm Springs again. Cause Oh, that's great. That's so good. It's so that's, good. And then yeah. my son made me sit down and watch Popstar. The, Palm Springs Adam, is the, the time travel one, isn't it? That's right, yeah, with, yeah, with okay. Adam, Adam Samba yeah. uh, uh, and um, Christina Milioti. Yeah. Ah, Christina Milioti. And um, then <laughs> my son made me watch Popstar, which is the, the sort of modern-day spinal tap that Adam Sandberg made about a terrible rapper. And I thought it was going to be dreadful, but it's mm. hilarious. Wow. Um, mm. That's yeah, really, Adam really Sandler good. Still makes it. Not Adam Sandler. I mean, Sandberg. Sandberg. Oh, Andy Sandberg. Okay. Andy Sandberg. Thank you. You see, That's names. <laughs> names. Names. My interest level between, between Adam yeah. Sandler and Andy Although, Sandberg. if you want to watch an amazing, if you want to watch an amazing Adam Sandler film, there's a film on Netflix called Uncut Gems, which is a masterpiece in which he plays a guy who has lost control of his life and tries to get it under control again oh. and fails. And the whole thing it's like the most astonishing white knuckle ride. Um, it's amazing. Um, I, I, I keep, on Netflix with Adam Sandler. It's a straight role. It's not a comedy. That. Yeah, I keep meaning to watch yeah. that because I've heard very good things about it as well. And then today, for my how much stuff you guys watch? Oh, I'm just. Uh, oh, got, I'm look, well, I, I have to look at my spreadsheet when I do this bit to to oh. keep track of what I've been watching because I'm I'm that guy. I'm and, I'm, and... I'm yeah. And I'm going to say a thing that appalls a lot of writers is that I write with the television on. So I'm watching television and writing at the same time. So, so wrong. Well, that, <laughs> the sheer power of that, RJ, is very impressive. Yeah, that, I, can't, <laughs> do I can't do it. Things at once? How? I can't that do it in silence. Brain? I, think I, I think I must have. I think that's the only way. But I can't do it in silence. And if it's music, it has to be music with lyrics. It can't be like, I, I know a lot of people listen to soundtracks and stuff. Oh, I, my God. You must have multiple it. brains. Well, this yeah. is this is very upsetting because you know I was already disappointed with how swiftly <laughs> you managed to write your murder mysteries, uh, your, your 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 new your new books. You did that in the space of some ungodly short amount of time, um, and now I find out that you have two brains as well. This is yeah, this the, is the ungodly upsetting. the the ungodly amount of time is for a reason. Duh. <laughs> it's it's because I so desperately did not want to start my new fantasy novel. <laughs> 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 to find something else to do, so I wrote, well, and and I sent I sent the um the process for for a kind of cozy crime novel to my agent. And he and I thought I said this before, so everyone listens to it up. It's a bit bored, but, but I like talking to Sam, and I've not talked to her for ages. Um, <laughs> and I had an idea, and I thought that idea must have been done because it's so obvious. And I sent it to my agent, and he wrote back and said, "Nobody's done it. Do it quickly, Kaching." <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did do it quickly, and hopefully I'll be getting edits back off him this week. So, oh, so this is not, I still haven't read it. I've, I've got that on my iPad, and I still haven't read it. I'm bad. When, no, I'm, no, trying it's, it's okay. to, when I'm trying to avoid doing work, I do something stupid and um, useless, like reorganize my pantry. 
You just like pop out. Of your book. <laughs> but you have an actual you have an actual job. I, d- I don't well, do anything else during the day. I do. <laughs> I get bitten by the cat. That's that's what I, that's my other. I do thing. sometimes think though that even if I didn't, even if I had more time, I would still find mm. ways to waste it so that I only worked when under intense pressure. Um, yes, I, I don't think I can be trusted with lots of free time. I think I, I wouldn't use it correctly. I'm glad we've got here because it neatly seeks into the the work segment of this where we talk about what we've been doing. But um, oh. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned intense pressure because I, I was there when you were finishing um, the, <laughs> the, the Hollow Empire. <laughs> and, Indeed. <laughs> and that is possibly the most intense thing I've ever seen a right to do because you just <laughs> you stayed up for like three weeks without sleep to finish your book. Yeah. That's that, true. That's true. I did. That, that, because we have a lot of wow. a lot of writers on here who come on and go, "Oh, I love writing," uh, and it's it's all oh. joyous and everything, and, and that's Did very I? much me. <laughs> 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 I think Scott has a bit of a hard time sometimes. Don't, well, don't I, yeah. I mean, I I uh, it's a double edged sword. I mean, I I yeah. came up with my first new book idea in in like two or three years the other day. And that's something that used to happen to me a lot. And it stopped happening because my life became awful. And now my life is less awful. And uh, all of a sudden, unbidden, as I was falling asleep one night, as you do, just when you're in that half awake state, a book idea came to me, a story idea came to me. And I rolled over and I wrote it down. And when I woke up in the morning, it actually made sense. It didn't just didn't just read oh, you know, like, photocopy popcorn or something nonsense like that. Um, <laughs> that's very impressive. <laughs> and... And I, I, I started thinking about it and I started plotting it. I was like really excited. This is a really good premise. And then I realized that oh. because it's said in the future and it deals with the consequences of climate change, the research I would have to do to write the book would depress me so fucking much I would be mm. unable to write the book. And I had oh. to stop and put it in a file. Yeah, that's so, that's, that's so sad. I also hate research, so I really feel for you here. Just yeah. make, make it up. No, I can't. Can you, can you just make it in a fantasy world so no. that you don't? Really do no, research. it wouldn't work. The whole thing's a pattern. The whole thing's like a, 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 a we're all doomed. Here's a story when we're all doomed. It's like I, I, I've just started to feel good about life. I don't want to spend a year researching for a trilogy about how we're all going to fucking die. I just can't do it. So I had to, I had to just put it away. Put, put a dragon and a couple of blocks of swords in it, and it's a fantasy book, and you can write whatever you want. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I I particularly wanted Sam to come on, so so she because I don't think we talk about coping with adversity much, and you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. This this is going to be another part of the story where I explain how I hate writing and everything about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you guys want to hear the story of of Hollow Empire? Yeah, we, we, if you're happy to tell yeah. it, we, we, if you don't want yeah, to, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's oh. over now, so I can be. Um, I can, Scott I can doesn't know, and, and I'm sure our listeners don't know, but I, I think it is because it's been a really well received book. Um, I've Thank not God. seen anyone <laughs> anything. I mean, no, one, yeah. no one's read it, but the couple of people who read it like it. So that's. But that's you've earned out, <laughs> which, is, which is the, the right sort of mark of success. Yes, that was a yeah. very large relief um, and a very yeah. large surprise, I should say, um, yeah. because there's this whole thing in writing where you don't – I mean, no one ever really sort of knows how they're doing, but I really mm. didn't know how I was doing. Um, and the only indication I was doing was that I was doing poorly. <laughs> so when, I, when I, a few weeks ago, got, I was having a phone conversation with my agent about the new book I'm working on, um, and she just sort of said at the end – Oh, and um, we finally, finally managed to get the last end of last year royalty statements out of out of the publisher, and um, and she said, "I'll um, I'll transfer you the the royalties. You should have that in the next next couple of days." And and I sort of said, "Sorry, sorry, what? Sorry, what was, what was that about transfer of royalties?" And she's like, "Oh yeah, I've got you know X dollars of, of royalties. I'll send you." And um, and I was like, "Sorry, has has the series burned out?" She's like, "Oh yes, yes, end of end of last year." It, it's 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 turned out, and I was like, I don't know why you didn't leave. It. <laughs> <laughs> Publishing um, is not good at communicating, is it? It's no, not, it's not no. For an industry that is about communication, it is it mm. is frighteningly um, bad at, at communicating. Um, yeah. So anyway, I feel much more sanguine about the whole thing now than I than I did when poor RJ was listening to me stay up all night 
um, yeah. trying to write a book. Um, so for, for a bit of background, um, City of Lies came out in 2018. Um, and I, I'd sort of written written the book and at the time when, when the publisher bought to a two book deal office, we had to at the same time submit an outline, which I had done. Um, but then in, in, in edits, the book had changed quite a bit. So the outline that we'd originally written didn't really work anymore, chiefly because the book was originally written as a book with no mag was a no magic fantasy. So there was no magic at all in it. Uh, and in, in edits, um, uh, Tor got me to change it into a, a more traditional. Uh, smelling epic fantasy, so so we introduced magic, and that made obviously <laughs> quite a large difference to what sequel was. Magic is real, as opposed to uh, not real. Um, so anyway, when I when I sort of went through the whole, well, hey, releasing a new book, and there's so much more work associated with the release time than you think there is. Um, and so I hadn't really got done that much work on the sequel yet. Um, but anyway, I. I pre started later than I ought to have on the, on the sequel anyway, because of all of that, that sort of stuff. So, anyway, I wrote a book and I was running behind on it. Um, and it, the original draft of it was too long, uh, which was fine when I submitted it. I knew it was too long, but I thought, you know, given I'm a bit behind, we should, we should get on top of this so we can at least get a gist of it. Um, and so, my, my editor and her assistant had a, had a copy of the book and, um, my editor didn't manage to read it, which was probably not a good sign. Um, so she read part of it and gave me some notes and her assistant had, had read it and gave me notes. So I had a, a plan about how to, how to fix it and how to cut it back down to length. Um, uh, so I spent a very frantic summer of um, 2019, I guess. 2019? Mm. Is that right? I'm, mm. I'm losing track of time slightly. Might have been the summer of 2019, might have been the summer of 2018. Um, rewriting a book, basically. And I had to cut 100,000 words out, um, which is that's a, a mad tough. amount. 100,000 words. That is, yeah. That's, uh, you know, I How long was, was the um, original version? So it, was, it was almost, the original version was almost 300,000 words. Obviously, <laughs> it's <is> absurd. Um, <laughs> so I spent, I spent that's very, quite long, yeah, Sam. That's quite long. It's quite long. Yeah. I spent a very frantic summer cutting a 300,000 word novel down to about 180, um, which is about the same length as the city. Uh, and I was, I was very, I should say. Wait, did you say 300,000 down to 180? Yes. Jesus yes. Christ. <laughs> right. And I was, I, I was in, in hindsight, just horrendously um, short-sightedly proud of myself for this effort um, because it's, it's quite hard. Uh, it was a lot of work and I was, I was very proud of the rewritten version. Um, which I submitted at the end of summer. And then um, there was just this awful long period of silence uh, <laughs> in which I didn't hear anything. Um, and yeah, it turned out I did not like my, my redone version. Um, and I then had very traumatic experience of, of being told, no, actually, we don't want this book. Um, we're going to push release back a year and you can try again. Um, so that's not fun news when you've already, um, you know, put that <laughs> much work into writing a very long book and then turning it into a much more sensible length book and being foolishly proud of yourself for doing so. Um, only to be told, no, uh, we don't like this. Uh, so yeah, that's very confronting as a writer and, um, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I definitely cried when my agent gave me that phone call. Um, I, I think I would fall apart if that happened to me. I absolutely it really do. It wasn't, yeah, 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 I, I yeah it wasn't. It wasn't fun. No. I don't recommend it um, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a business model. <laughs> I'm, I'm just writing that down as a note. Try, try not to do yeah, that. No, yeah, just don't, don't do that. Um, and then yes, there was a sort of awkward, frustrating time trying to work out what my publishers did want. Um, mm. So we were sort of just on very different pages, I think, and. Um, publishing being difficult to communicate um i just felt like i didn't know what they actually wanted or you know which bits they liked and which bits they didn't like um and you know whether even at the initial point whether they wanted me to do 
particular edits or whether they just want me to start from scratch. Um, it was quite difficult getting that information out, uh, which was very frustrating and upsetting at the time. Uh, I, think anyway. thing, I think I think a lot of people don't understand about edits is they kind of have a, an image of your editor being very sort of specific, going, well, this needs to be more this and that, and can you move this or that? And a lot of edits are just some version of, can you make this good, please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think essentially that's that the note. The note was not this. <laughs> what do you want? Not not what you've done. <laughs> so, so um, it took me a little while to sort of come up with a an, an outline that that they then seemed interested in, um, and that kind of involved a very. Um, difficult process of, of trying to work out the things because we sort of originally envisioned this as, a, as an ongoing series. And it's very hard, like I, I'm sure you guys have seen the same thing, but um, sometimes publishers buy trilogies up front, but mm. their tendency these days is that they like to buy two um, and see how they go before they commit to making it three. So you have to write effectively when you're writing a second book, it's you know, it's, it's Schrodinger's sequel, I like to mm. call it, because you don't know at the time when you've got one of these two book deals, you don't know whether you're writing the end of a trilogy or the middle of a trilogy. And those two oh, kinds God. of books are quite different. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah. that's a, a difficult balance to strike. And and because at the time when you're writing it, you don't know how the first book's gone yet. Um, you don't actually know whether they're going to want a third one or not. Um, and my, my, my publishers were always extremely vague about wanting to do that. They don't want you to close off all the options and tell a complete story because they want the option of being able to say, oh, now a third one. But they also, you know, don't want you to write one that's going to leave people satisfied if um, if you don't get to write a third one. So I was trying to find that balance and sort of essentially poached a bunch of things that I would have used in a third book to put into the second one because now I felt, you know, having had my book rejected, that the chances of there being a third one were very low. Um, so I thought, okay, fine, I will, I'll try to use kind of ideas that I would have held off um, for a third one, um, and I smushed together a new outline and took a few months to get uh, to get that kind of approved and then get started on it. Um, and then I sort of happily went along and, and wrote that, and um, I gave it to <laughs> having learned from last time. I gave half of it to my editor early on, earlier on to say, "Hey, is this is this going well?" Um, and I remember getting it before Christmas, um, so I think I gave it to her in November or so. Um, and then, and she wrote back and said that, yeah, this is, this is on track. Love it. Great. And, and so I was, I was very relieved and having a good Christmas, really working hard because that's, that's the time of year where I had some time off. So I, I often get a lot of work done over the summer uh, because I, you know, I've, got, I've got small kids, so I am often have time off for my day job. So lots more time to actually get, get work done. <laughs> so I did, I did another summer of, of effort uh, and then, and this is the bit where RJ remembers very strongly. Um, I, I I got notes in January, sort of more like, a, oh, here's a follow up to our, you know, the comments I made before Christmas, um, saying, oh, um, this is, this is good, but um, I don't think we need this part of the second half of the book from the outline. I think you should just not do that. Um, <laughs> so effectively changing the outline um, and. You know, you can't just change what's going to happen in the last half of the book. I mean, I'd already written most of it anyway of the mm -hmm. summer. Um, but then I had to kind of not just pull those bits out of the bits I'd written, but also rework the first bit so that it worked with a different second half. And it was very stressful. And then um, I was working through that and uh, my agent checked in with me um, and said something like, Oh, how's you know how the, how the rewrite's going? I'm just conscious that um, you know they're they're due in a few weeks. And I wrote back. I was like, what, sorry, what? No one's given me a due date. What was what was the due date? Uh, it turned out there was yeah a bit of a communication slip <laughs> slip up. So we didn't. Um, I didn't have that date. Everybody else had a date that I needed to submit the book by, and that date was in three and a half weeks, uh, which oh, is where wow. it comes in because we're in the same Discord, group and I was awake for most of those hours <laughs> trying to do I think I so I think in that three and a half weeks I wrote about 90,000 words um 
which is unprecedented for me because I'm a lazy, slow writer uh, and I don't ever get that kind of quantity done, but sheer necessity forced me <laughs> into, into getting that done. Uh, and it was very, very traumatic. And I was very grateful for um, particularly um, friends off in the UK who were, you know, awake at all of the crazy hours when I was trying to do things. Um, I even, yeah, I finished, I finished the draft. At, I, I stayed up all night the night before. Um, and was still sort of solving last minute plot problems in the middle of the night. My, I, my son's got up in the morning and um, my younger son said to me, Mummy, why did you go outside at one o'clock in the morning? <laughs> because <laughs> Mummy had to go out and solve a plot point um, at 1am the day before it was due. Um, so I was, <laughs> I was in my pyjamas literally walking up and down my street because I don't know if you guys find the same, but I, I often solve plot points by walking. Walking is, is magical. Um, and so I was literally just walking up and down my street, just thinking, shit, 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 how am I going to get out of this? Um, and yeah, and I finished it at 7.30 a.m. or something, which is, it was 5, 5 p.m. New York time. It's, it's something like nine in the morning for us, I think. Uh, so, you know, I, I submitted it about an hour and a half before it was due. <laughs> I have not slept for about 36 hours. Um, so, yeah, that was the most, that was the most intense um, period of writing I've ever had. And it was, again, not recommended uh, as, a, <laughs> as a model for, for working. Um, and it just, yeah, anyway, so it left me with this uh, second book that was very traumatic to write and wasn't the original book that I wanted to write, but which simultaneously I'm, I'm actually very proud of um, and has, has been well received as far as I can tell. Um, so it, it's a strange, it's, it's very hard to sort of think about this book um, uh, sort of objectively because it has so much weirdness tied up with it where it's, it's, it is both, it is both the, a book that I uh, am proud of and a book that caused me a lot of trauma. <laughs> so in a, in a way, I think it's sort of just going to sit there as like, this, this has got to be, it's got to be the worst experience writing a novel that I'm, that I'm going to have. Right. Like, because we, I don't know if we I'm are, myself, but surely that has to be <laughs> as bad as it gets. <laughs> we, we often talk about writing being an, an obsessive thing, really, to some degree. You, it's done from a sense of obsession. And I think you're proving that's true by the fact that you mentioned earlier on the new one that you're working on. <laughs> so and, and is, this, is this a third or is it a, re, a, a new no, thing? No, no, this is something entirely new. Um, no. Because yeah, I, I, I mean, again, I still, I still don't actually know whether there will be a third. Um, we, we, my, my publisher has the right of, you know, first refusal for whatever I do next. Um, and so we have, we have something new that I'm writing and, um, and an outline for a third if they want it that we're that we're pitching, but. I haven't actually picked it yet because um, I'm still working on it because, again, slow, terrible. But do you, have, you have a problem. Can, can you tell us anything about your new thing or is it too new? Because I know that kind of – No, no. Um, it's <laughs> – call it, I'm calling it my, my um, Hades Town Les Mis with Ghosts book. So <laughs> it's, it's sort of sort of part um, part uprising of the underclass and part um, – part to send into hell to rescue a loved one uh, and also lots of angry ghosts. So it's like something quite different to, to Poison um, Wars. I'm sold. Is, it, is, <laughs> it, is that a, in a second world or in, in our world? Or, or... Oh, always secondary world. I'm, I'm too lazy yeah. to set anything um, anything in a world in which I could be caught up on. You know, <laughs> access. Yeah. I don't. I don't like having to get things right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very familiar feeling. To, to me, to me, definitely. And what have you been? What have you been up to, Scott? Scott Lee. Scott. Uh, I'm traumatized by that story. Um, <laughs> I I would not survive that. I, yeah. I I would have thrown a tantrum at some point and just walked away from my entire writing <laughs> career and oh. just become one of these these weird obsessive self publishing gurus on the internet. Um, I'm yeah. just going to pause this first. <laughs> so I remembered to ask the cash for questions question because Katie's just, I would not have done if Katie hadn't just reminded me. Um, we have a Patreon, by the way, which you can, you can guarantee your question gets asked. Um, as oh, long no. as you, as long as you bother us <laughs> into asking that question. <laughs> um, it's from Katie and um, she said, City of Lies has one hell of an opening line. Was it something you struggled to come up with or did it just come to you? Oh, thanks, Katie. Um, I, I wrote that. That was the first thing I wrote of the book, actually. 
that was the only line that never changed, I think, probably, um, mm. in edits or anything. Uh, so, that, yeah, that was the first sentence I wrote down for the book. Um, I, I have a sort of a thing with writing where um, I'm never – I can't settle into the book until the opening is, is right. Um, and um, th with that one I was quite fortunate that um, the, the sort of – I idea that I had the kind of concept concept for City of Lies of this this brother and sister um poison testers. They they sort of came to me as a fairly sort of well formed idea already. I already kind of knew who they were and what their relationship was about and that the book was going to be about the, the sibling relationship and um and their bond with, with this this person who they've grown up as their childhood friend, um, but also who's you know it's their job to protect him and, and the kind of ten inherent tensions that will arise between the three of them, and that that sort of character based idea came to me first up, um, but the first thing I actually wrote was that was that opening line, um, um, and it sort of helped me kind of center what the book was going to be like, um, so it was nice having that that initial opening, but. Um, Everything, everything else in the everything else in the first chapter changed about four hundred thousand times. That was the last thing to get right. Uh, <laughs> I'm still rewriting chapter one over and over again. Um, you know, right at the end before before I is, think is your, I was still sneaking things in. Is your process quite rewrite intensive? Because I know we've not had Anna Stevens on. We should do because I know she she basically writes an entire book, throws it all away, and does it again. That's that's her process. Well, you know, I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't, obviously I did that inadvertently with Hollow Empire. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't like throwing things out because you know I'm, I'm lazy and I want to keep the the work that I've already done. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm 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 slow because I I try to get things right at the time. So so actually, hmm. short of short of having to chuck out an entire book and rewrite it again, um, my rewrites are usually just sort of cutting down and you know going back and sprinkling more clues through and fixing up I, I like to sort of set myself traps when i'm writing so i write very um chronologically i can't i can't skip ahead um because if i skip ahead i can never fill in the gap um i hate filling in gaps and uh, it always sounds so, so sort of tempting to be like oh i'll just um i'll write this bit because i know what's going to happen in this bit I'll, I'll write ahead but if i do that i'll never i'll never properly fill in the gap uh so i force myself to write chronologically um but I'm not a huge pre. I, I, I sort I sort of know what the story is going to be, but in, in terms of the small fine details, I like to sort of sprinkle uh, crumbs for myself to solve later. <laughs> do you do it as? I don't know as... whether I don't know whether it's like my, my subconscious is already knows what's going to happen, or whether I'm just an asshole who likes to you know set traps for myself <laughs> later. <laughs> so my favorite kind of sort of writing, world building things and character things is to just sort of you know, have a mysterious conversation with someone where there's some subtext. And I don't know at the time, I don't know at the time what the incident that's, that's guiding this is. I just have to fill that in later. Um, so a lot of the time rewriting is sort of going back and, and, and fixing those and making sure that I follow it up on things like that and, and mostly cutting down words because I, I write down, I write down really, you know, too much, too much the first time and then have to, I, have to cut. I, but the, one of the reasons I'm so slow is because I, you know, on a sentence level, I, I, I don't like to just get stuff down that I'm going to have to throw out. I prefer to get it in, in a state that I'm relatively happy with, uh, which means a lot of kind of, if you watch my, you know, when you get one of those keystroke um, programs where they, you know, replay how many keystrokes you do, that would be a humiliating um, thing for me because it would just be like constant deleting and rewriting as I go. I'd be much more efficient to do it Anna's way, I think, and, and just get things out. And then first drafts wouldn't trouble me so much. Do you do, because there are, there are things coming up in a book that I know are coming up and I want to write, and I think there'll be loads of fun to write. And they're like my reward for writing the really yeah. dull stuff that I don't want to do. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. the candy bar scenes, yeah. Yeah. Is, and yeah. is that you as well, Scott? Or are you... No, I'm, I'm very different. I, I do one draft. I'm a one draft writer, but I edit mm. constantly as I go. Yeah. So by the time I write the final sentence, the book's done. Mm. Um, entirely done. Pretty much. That's very pretty much. I mean, it goes off to an editor. The only time that hasn't the only time that hasn't really worked was book two of the the Time Bomb trilogy, where I I finished a draft, and I knew it was terrible. Um, mm. as the first time I've done that, and I had no idea how to fix it. I was just completely in the weeds and so i thought mm. i'm i'm just going to send this to my editor and 
I trust my editor. She will tell me how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even send it in and say, this is awful. Help me fix it. I just sent it in and said, here it is. And I waited. And a week Ooh, later. You her main trap. <laughs> well, no, I just, I had such absolute trust in her. I wanted, I want, I just, I, 10 days later, I got this, this email back with, okay, here's why this doesn't work. Beat, 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 beat. Here's how you fix it. Beat, 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 beat. Get back to me. And it was it was oh, wonderful. Lovely. She just she solved all the problems in in one email, and it was exactly what I needed. And then I knew exactly what I had to throw away, and what to rewrite. But other than that, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a first draft first draft writer. But as I say, I'm constantly revising. I start each day by by revising and editing what I wrote the yeah. day before before I move yeah. on to so write. So you have Try. a lot of keystrokes going on too. <laughs> oh yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. So I did, I did what Scott did with the second Bone Ships book in that I finished it and thought, this is a huge mess. This is a terrible, terrible book. And I just sent it to my editor and said, it's done. And I just didn't want to think about it at all. Mm. And then when I got the edits back, she hardly touched it. She just said, I love this. And I genuinely <laughs> thought the edges, she just read it and thought, it's not worth it. Can't be bothered. It's too good. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know her well enough that she would never do that. That's just not who she's at all. But that no. was because I just decided it was terrible. I couldn't get it out of my head. I just thought they've just given up on me. And it is, and it is still Jenny, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah she would Jenny, never, Jenny ain't letting you get away with anything. <laughs> no, no, she's not. Is, I've, I've told you from about the three levels of Jenny's edits, haven't I? The, no, go on. The, there's um. Have you thought? Which just means it's occurred to her. As, as uh -huh. she's going along, and, and then there's. I think you might, which means I, I will do my absolute best to convince you you should do this. But maybe if you <laughs> give me a good reason, you get away with it. And uh -huh. then there's we we think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's coming out the book. We <laughs> think. It, yeah, I'm not going to win that. No matter what I do, I just have to find. And the only time I've ever. Usually, when when she does the sort of second level, I tend to go with. Them. The only time I've not done that is um in the burn ships where I describe how they use the weapons, and it's like three pits, massive, it's loads of it, uh, and I just sort of said it's not a book about ships unless unless you massively over explain the loading of the cannons, it just isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it kills it for me. And she went, all right, well you can have that. Okay, that that'll be your thing. <laughs> <laughs> you owe me one now, aren't you? But, but it's yeah. very hard figuring out how ships work because I've got my, my current book is set on an island and there will have to be mm. ships, but I'm very frightened of researching how ships work. I only have the very vaguest idea that they sort of float and there are some sails that push them along. <laughs> you, nobody knows how they work, so you can black most of them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the truth of them is they are far a proper sort of big square rigged three three mastered sailing ship is just too complicated unless you're going to spend a decade sailing them you're not going to understand it so you just sort of the best way of doing it is to have your character not understand how ships work yeah yeah that was the system i was going with yeah and then, then, then to point of view characters on the ship i made a point of him being very clueless about how ships work yeah lots of other people talking about ropes a lot a lot of talk about ropes yeah yeah, yeah. I'm not clear what the ropes do, but I'm very aware that there are a lot of ropes. And the really, really sort of thing that you've not been trained to think about ships, but is absolutely true, is the more wind there is, the less sails you have. Because you have this like, image of the ship with all its sails up. But once yeah. it actually starts to really blow, they start taking them in because it would just pull the ship over. And, um, uh, and you also have the ship... Yeah, you have the image of the ship with its um, pennants sort of trailing behind it as it goes along at speed. And it never does that because the pennants, the little flags on the top, the sort of flaggy flags, they always point in the direction of the wind. Um, so they're never facing behind the ship because the ship would just belong backwards if it was doing that. Mm. And it's just weird. Is, is, ship, is ship Twitter like horse Twitter, where if you get things wrong, they get very crossy? No, no, no. The there isn't a ship Twitter. I didn't manage to no, find it. No, there's no ship Twitter. There no, there's this, this historic... I'm, I'm quite scared of horse Twitter. Yeah, are you? I'm, I'm quite scared of... They're fascinated by legal Twitter. I like legal Twitter. That's my favourite. Is legal Twitter a real thing? Yeah, legal Twitter's a real thing. It's, it's snarky. <laughs> this is me, snarky. a lawyer, not knowing yeah, legal Twitter yeah. is a real thing. <laughs> but I can help you with ships. <laughs> if you want to know about ships, I can... 
uh, I had a lovely thing from somebody who sailed big ships and they emailed me to say this is absolutely not how ships work, but it feels like it is. Yeah, well, and, that's, and that, that's really all you can ask for. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've got a friend who's a professional sailor, um, and and he wrote, he read the first draft of the Bone Ships, and he just wrote back, and it's my favourite comment. It's one of those things that I'd have framed if I could and didn't have a child because it's not not child friendly. Um, but he, he said, <laughs> "This is far and away the best thing you've written. I loved every moment of it, but you know, fuck all about how ships work, mate." <laughs> <laughs> And I just love that. I'm like, yeah, but it's fantasy. You know, somebody says, "Well, it's not our ships." I know. Can get I just feel like the aesthetics, the aesthetics of ships, are quite appealing. Yeah. Um, in the fantasy context, everyone likes sort of the idea. But um, yeah, the actual <laughs> mechanics of it. Unless you're going to be, you know, Robin Hobb riding ships, having you know yeah. been married to a, a sailor for you know forty years, um, it's very hard to kind of get that level of expertise. I think. And and you know, as, as I said before, I'm very lazy, and I, I don't. Well, that, I feel like I, I want that level of expertise in anything that I'm not being paid for. That's how I, I knew I'd done it because Robin gave me her blessing. And, and that's, she said, that's true. She did. Yeah. And, and she said that she that knows how she's on the covers, yeah. Yeah, bless her. Alicia asks, do you use beta readers? Oh. Oh, um, well, I've only written two books so far, um, and the process of them is very different. <laughs> Um, I, I didn't have any time with the second. I would about to, to say, to, yeah, you would have a chance. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, that's it's not true. Every chapter I was writing at the time in that last three weeks, both my younger sister, who always read, so I, my younger sister is my main beta reader. She reads everything that I write before anybody mm-hmm. else does. Uh, in this case, every chapter I wrote, I would immediately send it to um, Anna Stevens and and my sister, and they were reading them for me, like literally mm-hmm. on the spot, um, in the middle of the night. In Meg's case, the, the some of the nights she was setting alarms in the middle of the night so she could wake up and check and, and read the stuff that I was sending and check, but I was still awake and still going. Um, so she just had some yeah. kind of, she's amazing. She just had some kind of plaque or metal or uh, many cakes um, because she's incredible. Uh, yeah. So Anna and Anna and Meg were reading things for me on the spot. Um, with the first one, I was too scared to show anybody my work um, <laughs> for many years. Um I, I, unlike many people who, you know, form writing communities and, and work together and stuff, I was a solitary hobbit of a writer. Um, and aside from aside from immediate family members, um, no one ever read anything I did until I was ready to submit it to agents. Uh, so in many ways, sort of agents were the first people who, who read uh, outside my immediate family group. Um, I'm probably slightly less self-conscious now than I was then um, on account of having, I mean, I wouldn't even, I was, I was so self-conscious about my writing that I, I just lurked in the local, we have quite a, an active um, uh, spec fiction, spec fiction guild here in Canberra. uh, And I was aware of this and I followed the mailing list. um, And I think I even joined, joined the group, but just lurked on the online forums never saying anything or participating in any way uh, for, some, for some time until I got an agent and, and sort of had some sort of validation that, okay, you're not terrible at this. Uh, then, then I was brave enough to attend a meeting um, because, yeah, I was just, I just felt like I wasn't qualified or something, um, which is very weird. I'm a bit old, so obviously I sort of missed the, the whole kind of fan fiction thing mm, on the I'm, internet. If I, was, if I was 10 or 15 years younger, I might have, I might have kind of been participating in that and and met people that way, but I, I think I'm just a bit too. By the time we got the internet, I was in the university, so it wasn't it wasn't like a mm. you know we still had dial up dial up um, modem and, and and you had to you know use the phone line and you could only be on the internet for a certain period of time. Uh, when I was in no one can phone so out if you're on the internet. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And as, as I said, I was one of five children, so we had a big household and you can't just tie up the phone line for all that time. Um, so I, I sort of missed out, I think, on a lot of the community that in the, the pre-writing, pre-published stage that, that I probably would have had if I'd been 10 or 15 years younger than I am. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I would hopefully now I have a bunch of wonderful author friends, um, which makes the whole process so much nicer. And if you, you know, have people who are able to read your stuff, before you send it out, that's a that's a wonderful thing. And you know, one day I hope to be organised enough to have written a book that that has time to go to anyone other than my agent before I send it off. Uh, but until until I've created a work pattern that is um, 
less frantic and behind on everything all the time. <laughs> I think I'll probably end up just sending things straight to my agent and she'll have to deal with, with my nonsense. Because I have three uh, and uh, I've, they've been with me a long time and they're, they're, they were friends before they were readers. And what I like about them is that I know how they all think. So I know what they say that I can ignore, which is, yeah. it's just lovely. To go, well, I, I know that is what you think uh, and I'm not going to do that. And then Scott tends to read my more thrillery. RJ, Scott cheats on me with RJ Dark. I do. Um, I'm unfaithful. Cause, yeah, because he, he's, he's really good at thrillers and and the way they work, which is useful for you too, Sam, if you want to. Yeah, I was about to say, touch him up, I meant hit him up. Don't touch him up. <laughs> don't touch him up. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. that. That's not, not applicable. It's wrong. It is. It's wrong. It's wrong. You get trouble. <laughs> but but um, we were asking Scott what he was working on, and we got terribly sidetracked. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. No, 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 that's the whole point. <laughs> bugger all. Um, I'm supposed to be writing this uh this novella that I've been commissioned to do, but I, I have been sidetracked by life events. And as I said, uh, a, a great idea for a, a book that I can't write. So um, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm now, uh, what were we saying about procrastination being the best way to get writing? I'm now five weeks yeah. away from delivery and I've yet to write the first sentence. So I'd better get my skates on with that really, hadn't I? Yeah. Are you going to be doing a Sam? It's going to be yeah. I don't, I don't, luckily. It's it's an event. I don't know how much so you like only... walking up and down the street in your pajamas, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the neighbours have asked me have asked me to stop. Um, uh, I no, if it's only twenty thousand words, so it should be okay. It should be okay. He says overconfidently. I, I've been um, I've I've been writing the fantasy novel that I was putting off writing, and I'm enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would do. I said that before, which is quite. So there's not much happening in it. It's just people walking around in the woods. That's the entire plot of it, I think. It's classic. That's classic fantasy, right? Yeah, oh, it's not, love yeah. It in the woods. Yeah, it's not how I sold it to my editor. But, um, but that's <laughs> what, yeah. <laughs> that, well, that's this is woods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and there's people, people walking around in them and, and falling out and becoming friends, stuff like it's quite Robin Hoody, that that sort sort of thing. Um, but I'm, I've I've cleared seventy thousand words, so I feel like I'm sorry. Did you say Robin Hoodie or Robin Hoodie? Robin Hoody now would have been okay. Robin Hoody before. <laughs> I, I would I would like to read a book about a person with a bow and arrow who who and a comfortable evil blanket. while wearing a comfortable blanket. With a hood. A hoodie. Yeah. yeah, I did. I did. I've written quite a, a speech that I'm quite quite proud of about um, how it's, it's just my politics. How bows and arrows are banned in this world because magic users. There's quite a short short sort of range for your magic uh, and someone has a bow and they just go this is the this is our great equalizer uh, just like, yeah that's that's quite a nice that thing. is nice yeah. yeah let's destroy the people in power and um uh, rj I'm dark put in the chat so you can see what i'm talking about <laughs> oh, oh my gosh rj dark asked me to edit the second mal and jackie book so i did that I finished <laughs> did that. he ask very nicely no no he he rang me up crying um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and begging, begging me, and I thought, well, people associate you with me now, so I'm going to have to make sure this book's all right. Uh, so I, I edited that this week. It's so fucking and needy. It's so needy. He is. It's just, just a terrible, terrible human being. Uh, <laughs> and and I'm all right? yeah. No, 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 no. We hate each other. Ter- terrible. And I, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I've gone back to writing. To stripping back a bit, my American set crime novel that Scottish slang with me for not not sticking to the original. You've been told to take all the violence out. I like the fact that it was so violent. Yeah, I've been told to make it less overtly violent and oh. less sweary. So it's less sweary. Are you telling me, RJ, that Americans don't like viol- the, the strong violence? The UK well, has I- a higher tolerance. Was it you telling me that? Yeah, yeah. This is apparently the the, the thing which I I would never have thought with the books I read. But then I went back and and. Second Bosch mention of the night. Um, I, I've reread all of Michael Connolly's Bosch books, and they are violent, but they're not descriptively violent. So people right. get shot, but there's not a lot of blood. So and and they're not very oh, polite violence. Yeah, yeah and, and they don't talk about like the pain of it and things like that. So I'm kind of stripping out stuff like that. Less that brings, me, that brings me back to the other thing that I watched that I was going to mention. Mm. Um, 
today. 18 virus, yeah, some do do to sit. Do yeah, tell. yeah, that's exactly it. Today I watched yeah. Went to the Day Well. Does anyone know that movie? No. It's a, it's a movie that was oh. made in 1942 as a propaganda movie. Yeah, that's, that's why I don't know the movie. <laughs> yeah, about uh, uh, and and the premise. It's made by Ealing Studios, who are famous for their you know chirpy comedies. Oh, in which yeah. everyone talks very much like that. You know, oh, gosh, <laughs> shall, shall we go and have a gin uh, on, on, on the patio? <laughs> oh, um, and so you open with this beautiful bucolic English village where there's, you know, there's a, a, a policeman and a, a little woman who runs the shop and someone on the switchboard and a vicar. And then it gets invaded by Nazis. And it turns <laughs> into an absolute bloodbath. It's oh, wow. <laughs> There's a sequence where, where the. What is it called? It's called Went to the Day Well. There's a sequence where the, the local postmistress, who's, you know, a, a, a lovely, bucolic, older, round lady with rosy cheeks, and there's a German in her kitchen who's, who's keeping her hostage. And she uh, just, oh, would, you, would you like some sausages? And uh, you need the pepper and oh, have a cup of tea. You like sausages, don't you, you Germans? And then she reaches for the pepper. She throws it in his eyes, grabs the axe out of the fireplace and hacks him to death. Lord. And then, then, she, then she goes over to the phone. She says, hello, could you put me through to Overton, please? Please put me through to Overton. And then she walks in and bayonets her. It's, it's like it's wow. an ealing comedy for 20 minutes. And then suddenly Quentin Tarantino takes over. It's incredible. <laughs> It's the most bloodthirsty film I've ever seen. There's no actual blood on screen, but good Lord. So went the day well. I highly recommend tracking down I'm, and I'm watching gonna, this film. I'm going I'm to bring us around to the... Um, oh, we, we, there's the question that I asked that people said I should ask again, um, oh. which is, it's not actually... We, we should be... We should have ended half an hour ago, Sam, so if you need to go, just oh, tell us... No, no, it's us. We always run on left, very I left, long. I left a lot of instructions for my children for how to get themselves ready for school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, yesterday, yesterday morning, um, when I, I got up and did this, normally I get up at, um, at about six and my, my son and I take a dog for a walk uh, and then feed him. Um, but because I got up and you know, I patted him, but then I came into this other room and shut him out. He then punished me by pooping in the hallway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I have not yet smelt that he has done that to me, so I'm hoping that um, I'm hoping that they just fed him and, and that he has forgiven me. Lack of work. Sorry, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you. I think I know the answer to it. If if a genie came and stripped away your ability to write fantasy, but left you the ability to write, what is your next go to genre? Where would you go? Oh, me definitely histories. Yeah. Yeah. I like histories very much and yeah. um, sort of spy thrillery type books, um, as you can probably tell from the flavour of the fantasy books. Anyway. But having said that, sort of everything I write, even if I, I, I try to make it a, a a different genre, sort of ends up having speculative fiction in it anyway. That just seems to be the way my brain works. And, I, and maybe it's partly it's because of um, the, the the lack of desire to get anything right and thus set things in worlds where I make up the rules. Um, I think it's probably just just that I'm so indoctrinated into the idea of other worlds. I just like I like having them there. So even if the story is really a, a different thing, it, I always like it where fantasy clothes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm very I'm very impressed with you and Jen writing writing crime as well because it's um yeah that's obviously like as a reader this is like my my authors that I love writing in more than one genre that I like reading is is a delightful treat for me. It, it, I, I love writing. I actually found writing, no, RJ Dark would say writing crime is a lot easier than writing fantasy because you don't have to keep track of all the stuff you've made up. Well, that's true. <laughs> you, could, you just so you say what a house. That's probably the balancing like, factor, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You've got to get things right, but you also don't have to make up, you know, an entire. Yeah, yeah. Just, but everyone knows what a, yeah, what a house looks like and, and the way the world works. So you just kind of don't have to keep a track of that but i'm gonna i'm gonna go on to our last question of it uh, and then we've done all the the rightopolis stuff um which is we have the rightopolis playlist which i have absolutely forgotten to add the last three lots of tracks to and it's all in my i have a notebook but i don't it's there's no rhyme or reason to my notebook yeah, they're yeah. in here somewhere i, I know I, I just imagined it that 
everything about me must just set off all your bells, Scott, because you're quite organized. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, stuff's happening. Um, but, but anyway, um, you get to choose a song to go onto the right off list playlist, Sam. Um, but I'll go, to Scott, I'll go to Scott first, and then I'll do it so you've got some time to think about it. So, Scott, okay. have, you, have you got a track for us this week? I have. I'm going to select uh, an instrumental by Matt Berry, better known as... Um... Oh, my God, his name's gone away. Every loser I... wins, Matt Berry. No, I Drum can hear Stenders. you. I can hear you, Clem Fandango. Oh, oh that Matt Berry. That oh, Matt okay. Berry. Um, oh, it's, no, an, it's, think... it's an instrumental. It's the Night Terrors, the St. Etienne mix. It's Matt banging. Berry. The Night I... Terrors. The Night Terrors, the St. Etienne mix. It's banging. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to choose a song that I just came across this week. Um, and the band are called Wet Leg, <laughs> that I saw referred to basically in the comments as um, lesbian cottagecore power pop, which, which is, if that doesn't make you want to listen to a song, I know there's something wrong with you. Um, and the song is called Share's Long, <laughs> and it is the catchiest thing I've ever heard. It's just brilliant. It'll get in your head oh, and just stick in your head. You've chosen an Australian one. Not to oh. I mean. Sorry, I was oh. just Googling them. They're from Melbourne. Oh, well, he Excellent. clearly did that on purpose to make you feel like <laughs> You definitely did. But um, I watched the video of Wet Leg and Shares Long just because it's quite quirky and odd. Uh, and yeah, that, that's, it's, it's great. So, Sam? Um, I'm um, the Robert Smith and Churchill's collaboration, How Not to Drown, um, which is a just beautiful, exciting um, combination of like one of my old, all time favorite bands and, um, and, you know, actual new music, which I don't listen to enough of. <laughs> um, so um, I've heard that and it is brilliant. It is really good. And I, yeah. I played it. Um, so my kids, my kids love the cure um, because I've indoctrinated them into all my music tastes, obviously, but um, they'd never heard any, any churches. And I, I played them the song. Um, and so Robert Smith comes in in the second verse um, and just watching their little faces. Is that I said, please, I didn't tell them anything about it. I said, just listen to this. And um, they, the, the, the listening intently. And then um, um, Robert Smith comes in in the second verse. And both of them just, I, I played them separately. And they had both had the same reaction. Like their eyes just went super wide. And, it's the cure! That's Robert Smith! And I was so excited. <laughs> it was um, but it's a great song. done and right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's yeah the the, the lyrics are very I, I heard it, it came out at a time I was ha- having conversations with writer friends who are far more popular and famous than I am um, about how how difficult once they hit a certain level of popularity how much worse it made their online experience um, how much worse uh, sorry. Lyrics, how much we worse miss- it makes being online when you're oh, um, right. Yeah, the, the kind of online experience, once you get a certain number of Twitter followers, um, there's a sort of level of dehumanization um, that means that, you know, as a surprise, every time you log in, you might just have people Someone's, say horrible things to your face. Yeah. Someone said 10,000 um, is the number, I think. I feel like that's that seems to be the number. Yeah. yeah. Over. And obviously it's worse for, um, uh, for women um, mm. and um, it's worse for people who are marginalised in way um but yeah it just does seem to be once you get to a certain point um you just your experience just gets worse and and people treat you like not not a person anyway and the, the song came out a month or two ago at a time where we were having these conversations and the lyrics are also quite quite on point anyway it's a great song highly recommend a good thing for twitter is you can turn off um notifications from anyone who hasn't verified their email address Oh, that's probably a good thing to do, isn't it? Which I have, which means I just don't see a lot of stuff. Though I don't think I actually a lot of people bother with me. They just tweet at me about my cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't get any Twitter bother really because I'm, I'm not popular enough for people to be awful to. <laughs> it's a weird, it's a weird <laughs> thing. Once you're well loved and popular, that's when people start, you know, being really terrible to. Yeah, yeah it's, it's started about my cat. So yeah, every time I said, does anyone want to ask me any questions about writing? No, they want to ask me questions about my cat. Well, that's fair. 
<laughs> I don't know how to use Instagram other than just posting pictures of my dog flowers in my garden. So Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm too old for Instagram. I just yeah. don't get it. And every so often somebody will send me a message that is a story and I just don't know what to do with it. I just press yeah. like and, and hope I've not insulted them back. So it's very confusing. <laughs> I think if you hit like you're always okay, right? Fingers crossed, hopefully. Yeah. Do, do, yeah. do you understand Instagram, Scott? Yes. You, you, oh. But I have to because uh, my daughter got annoyed that I wasn't liking her posts. And so I, I, had, oh. to, I had to work it out. Otherwise, I would have been told off even more than I already was. I do, do you want to become my, my social media manager? <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've, all our social media managers. I've, I've, I've done, still yeah, still young. Been there, done that. I don't ever want to go back to doing that job. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're underestimating the amount of exposures that I will pay you. <laughs> Ours are about the same age, aren't they, Audrey? Your boy's about the same age as me. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. just just about to go up to secondary school. Just just finished primary oh, yeah. school as, as my yeah, boy. Yeah, he's a year, year older than mine's in. Old yeah. five this year. And he's, year he's very... Yeah, yeah, a bit young for social media still. Yeah, and he's not that interested, which is quite good. Well, that might change at secondary school. I don't know, but he's um, he and I, I don't put him on my social media if I can help it. Though he is part of um one of the big theatres here. He goes there, so he's he's actually quite a lot on the internet. If you know how to find him, but I don't think, tend to link to it. Well, that's, that's probably smart. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't put their faces on mine either. No. Sometimes back to their heads. Yeah, I put his hair on because his hair's magnificent. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure I've seen, I've seen your boy's hair. Um, yeah. Yeah, he, he, yeah, I'm quite jealous of his hair. It, it, it's, it's, oh, yeah. your hair's magnificent as well. Yeah, it's not as magnificent as his now. His is just, though, though his is really thick and straight, and, and I did not know what a tangle I can get into quite easily. Um, <laughs> well, it's like with the getting taller and getting bigger heads thing, right? We're passing along. Yeah. Yeah, greater, yeah, greater hair yeah. strength to the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, have, we have come up to um, an hour and three quarters. Um, we should probably stop now because um, Kate has to edit this. Do, do you want to say anything? It's been lovely, Sam. Really lovely. I'm sorry Kit couldn't be here because I know he's, he, he loves doing it, but um, life intervenes as it sometimes does. Um, and we will have you back when you have your new book out. Definitely. Oh, well, assuming I can sell it. <laughs> I mean, I've got to buy it first, obviously. Yeah. Um, the, the main stumbling block, the uh, lack of having written it. Well, I sort of, I sort of gave some chapters to my uh, agent and, and um, uh, she said it feels a bit too like it could be steampunk, um, which I can contend with. Like it could be what? Um, Steampunk, which apparently is not uh, selling at the moment. But I wasn't trying to write steampunk, so um, I, I'm sort of going back and trying to make it clear. No, no, this is on a tropical island. <laughs> it's has not steam- Victorian England. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, steampunk has never been selling. I can't think of a time when, when steampunk was. In fact, the only person yeah. I think who's, who's done it is Josiah um, Tower of Babel. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Which is, everyone is was, yeah, everyone was very carefully not calling steampunk, uh, and I can say that because mm. I, he said that in one of his tweets. So I think it's safe to say that. But um, I think there might be something difficult to sell about the term. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, obviously, everyone loves Josiah's books; they're great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't think I don't think I would, it would have occurred to me to call them steampunk. I think we're sort of missing the punk. Yeah. Maybe. See, to me, steampunk is really. Sp- Really, something quite specific. It, it, it's goths that can't carry off goth clothing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's, where, that's where they go. That, that's 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 what's yeah, it, what's very it's like a retirement home for failed too. goths. <laughs> and, and I say and that, that really so, yeah, with much affection because one of my one of my friends um, was one of the big sort of inventors of steampunk in the UK. He's one of the people who brought it all together. But um, and that is. I'm not going to say the name, just in case, but that's their description, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Sam, I spoke over you there. Yeah. No, no, no I, I, I what I was saying. Someone in, someone in the comments is asking a dinosaur question. What is the dinosaur question? Oh, oh, oh it's kicking uh, off. It's kicking uh, off. Well, first of all, do you like poetry, Sam? 
Um, well, I, I don't know a lot of poetry. To be <laughs> <honest>. <laughs> Also, I have to, oh, it's my what's my favorite dinosaur? Wait, I don't no. have to write a poem about it, do I? No, 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 no. Well, it's the, you only have it's a very binary choice in Rhytopolis. It's Triceratops or T Rex, and there is a right answer. Oh, and, well, it's Triceratops. I can't, clearly, you're see you. You're a great guest. Ah! Yeah, <laughs> you're a brilliant guest. <laughs> <laughs> he gets away and suddenly <laughs> it's just Triceratops town. Yeah, yeah. What you have to say is it's Triceratops in your face kit. Um, that that's the correct way of saying. Yeah, um, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the thing with poetry? Sorry, I I talked over the few. Um, kit kit hates poetry. Oh right. Yeah. So so really for a complete win for the. The good side of Rhytopolis is, is a guest about <laughs> poetry and the Triceratops. Yeah, well, sorry. I mean, I, I feel very ignorant about poetry, and mm. um, it, it makes me feel anxious and stupid. Um, <laughs> 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 I feel like I'm, I'm, gonna... not, I'm, I'm, I'm neither a good enough writer nor clever enough to um, be a poetry yeah. reader. <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that as, the, as your poetry ambivalent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Let's call me poetry anxious. Yeah, poetry angst, yeah. So, yeah. Now, Kit loves songs, Alicia, and, and he likes lyrics. Yeah. But, he, uh, but lyrics are not poetry. Yeah. yeah. It, well, I mean, I do like the music part, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. But if lyrics are poetry, then you have to admit um, Jim Morrison is a poet, which I refuse to do. No, 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 no. under no circumstances. <laughs> no. <laughs> that shall not pass. No, 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 we're, doing that. <laughs> we're not allowing that slippery slope to start. Um, but, but yeah, anyway, <laughs> it's, it's well, getting quite late in the UK. <laughs> We've had a wonderful time. You are, you have a dog mess to clean up and children to get to school. Um, <laughs> I'm going to open the library door and hopefully you will not be greeted by poop. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> So they it, ran it's... very quickly. They ran a little, um, like an advertising campaign a few years ago um, in Australia where they were trying to encourage people to make sure they changed the batteries in their smoke uh, smoke detectors. Uh, mm. And the ad was showing people um, being asleep, not being able to smell the smoke. And, and the whole concept was that you, when you're asleep, your your sense of smell goes to sleep as well. Mm. Um, so they were trying to you know, tell you, you're not going to wake up and smell the smoke because you, you, you don't smell when you're asleep, apparently. But I would like to say that this is a lie because I can smell dog poop and it wakes me up. When he punches me in this fashion, yeah, I, I don't think it's just. <laughs> <laughs> just before I just think you, this uh, is definitively proved it. Yeah, um, it's not. Well, it might be a question for you. Um, Kit has left me with very poor instructions. He has not told me how to switch off Craig the recording bot. Do you know, Scott? Ah, uh, no. Does anybody? <laughs> anybody in the chat continue know? record perpetuity? It does. It'll just record all night. We've done this before. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I think you can just disconnect. Do you think? I think. Shall I, shall I try? Shall we say goodbye before I try? Yeah. Well, we'll say goodbye. And thank you, everybody, Thanks for coming. It's Sam, been oh, wonderful. Oh, oh, look, no. Katie has done it for us. Look. This oh, is what's really good oh, about no. the chat. Because um, I always encourage ah, getting you know more competent right. people to um to participate in things so they can solve your problems. Yeah. So we'll stay goodbye now because I'm about to switch Craig off. So goodbye everyone. Right. You've been brilliant. Thanks everyone. Thanks for listening. Rightopolis records alternating Sundays via Discord. To take part in future shows, visit patreon.com forward slash Rightopolis podcast to find our server details. You can also support the show there in return for Discord perks and early access. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, and spread the word. Thanks again. Rhinopolis, 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 we're not just gonna kill it. Rhinopolis, 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 we're not just gonna kill it. Yeah.